It's going to get heated in here today, fellas, because we are debating our rankings against one another. One of us has an outrageous ranking compared to the other two. We are going to defend ourselves in our own rankings today on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Fellas Podcast. Welcome in. All three fellas are hanging out with you today. Lucas Wentzel, Cameron Lawrence, and Tyler Plath. Uh, can we go back to the archives and figure out the last time all three of us run an episode together? Has it been since the NFL draft? I feel like it has. Oh, it's been a long time. Uh, this mock is- draft 1.0. Oh, that yeah. might have been what it was. You're right. Ooh. We were there for the mock draft, but which was that's too almost long. a month ago. Almost that's a month too ago. Long. <laughs> that, that is dude. too long. Wait, Cam, were you in Minnesota when we did that mock draft? I was in Minnesota when we did that mock draft, yes. Brother, you've been in Minnesota for a month that I've only seen I, you once. This is sad. I've been in Minnesota I, for two months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh <basically>. no. <laughs> Brutal. Oh no. We are we are going to go head to head to head in our rankings today. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, one of us has a blasphemous ranking, maybe not blasphemous, but very different ranking uh, compared to the other two fellas. And we are going to defend ourselves in our rankings. Well, you'll understand the flow of the episode here uh, as we go on. But instead of trying to explain it in an intro, why don't we just dive on in and start the debate? So we're going to talk about six different players in this episode. That is two players for each of us to defend our rankings on. And we are going to go ahead and start with Cameron. Because Cameron, your ranking of Nico Collins at the wide receiver 27. The wide receiver 27 has got Ty and I in absolute shambles because he's Tyler's wide receiver 15. Nico Collins is my wide receiver 17 yet. You've got him 10 spots below both of us at the wide receiver 27. Brother, you need to plead your case as to why your ranking of Nico Collins is not blasphemous. All right. So first of all, I'm going to backpedal a little bit just because he is only 15 fantasy points in my rankings away from being the wide receiver 15. That's how close I have that chunk. Which uh, Lucas talked about that with moving T Higgins up. However, I'm less optimistic on Nico Collins for a couple of reasons. First, obviously the addition of Stefan Diggs. I know the end of last season wasn't very, he wasn't great for Diggs, but the dude had 160 targets, right? For four straight seasons. So he get he, he gets the ball thrown his way. He just does. Nico Collins on the other hand, last season, 29th in target share with only 22.7, 38th in air yard share with only 26.7. He caught 80 passes last year. Nico Collins did. He had 85 catchable targets. So do we really think again this season that every single catchable target he's, you know, like I I just think the rate at which he caught the ball, the efficiency in which he had um, catching, you know, 80 passes on only 119 targets. I just don't know if that repeats one more time. And so you're going to need to bank on that efficiency with Nico Collins with Stefan Diggs coming back in because yeah, he is going to draw maybe not 160 targets, but it's not out of the realm of possibilities. He sees 130, 140 targets, and you have a healthy tank Dell on top of that also. And then and then the last thing you factor in, his A dot was only 10.6 last season. His y- yards per reception was 16.2. So it's you know, I, I I just get a little worried that there's just too much like hyper efficient things that happened for Nico Collins this last year. That when the you know we come to another season of it where volume isn't guaranteed. We're just not going to see that same efficiency this, this next upcoming year. So I'm fascinated by this because you and I have Nico Collins statted out for very similar target amounts. You have Nico Collins at 125. Uh, I've got Nico at 126. Uh, you have him catching three less passes than I do. We have him quite literally only, what is it? 17 receiving yards apart. And you actually have him catching more touchdowns than me. <laughs> Yet, like we, you and I have Nico Collins statted out for the exact same amount of fantasy points. I'm first going to to pull that out because you have him at 239. I have him at 238. So you're right. I think this is a massive tier. Yep. 
but man, there there is something about him just getting that fresh contract. They went out and committed to Nico Collins as their guy. I know they went out and traded a first for Stefan Diggs. You didn't even bring up the Stefan Diggs case, right? Where yeah, you know, Stefan Diggs. Uh, you, you, I guess you did. You talked about 160 target guy, but you know they go, go on and give up capital for him as well. I think Nico Collins can lead this team in fantasy points without leading this team in targets, without leading this team in receptions, because I do think he's going to catch the most touchdowns on this team. I do think he's going to average the most yards per reception on this team. That is really my big point of discrepancy here is I think Nico Collins is going to be the more efficient wide receiver. I think he's going to be treated as the, like, I can't even like the one a minus to Stefan Diggs. I don't think it's like a one, a one B. I think it's going to be more of like a one, a minus. I only have these guys, six targets apart from one another. I've got Nico with 126. I've got Stefan Diggs. Uh, where is he at with 132 in my rankings? I, I, you and I just have this tier shuffled up differently. I can't fault you like for having Nico at the bottom of this year, but I think he belongs at the top of this year. Personally, Ty, what, what else can you bring against? Cameron's ranking here. I just think that we, if you take a look at where Stefan Diggs has been most successful over his career, it has been in the shorts on the outside areas of the field versus Nico Collins last year. He was much more downfield and over the middle. Uh, and again, I, I feel like these two wide receivers, they are going to, I don't want to say they complement each other, but they won't necessarily be fighting over each other in the areas of the field that they can work together. And I still think that there's a world where Stefan Diggs can still be the lead target getter, the lead reception guy in this offense, but it's going to be Nico Collins that is going to be the better fantasy uh, receiver to have just because I think he's going to be finding more high value targets downfield over the middle in the red zone and like that. So it's close, but I, I don't, it may be the better way to say it too. I just don't think that last year necessarily was a fluke. I don't think last year was um, just a, a one year thing. I think Bobby Slowick created this offense, what you call just big body target over the middle of the field for CJ Stroud. And now you get a route runner and step on digs. So you've got defenses have to choose or am I going to cover or try to take away the short game? Am I going to risk getting beat over the top by a guy like Nico Collins? The one thing, sure. I'll, I'll, oh, the one thing I'll, I'll chime in with one more thing too, because uh, looking, I mean, looking at Nico Collins, I think it's very clear, you know, he is more of the vertical stretch the field can work him over the middle too, but second in yards per route run last year, 3.24 yards per route. That is an astronomically high number. I mean, his third in yards per target as well. Ninth in yards per reception. You still have, he was still sixth in yards after the catch as well with 549 yards. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just think Nico is a big play waiting to happen where having him with the wide receiver 27, I think almost discredits that ability and discounts that, you know, upside. Um, but again, it's a massive tier. I get it. You know, if you if you were to give Nico five more, four more receptions, you know, he probably shoots up. Yep. Eight spots in your rankings. Definitely. He definitely does. And I, I think I see it very similar to how I'm viewing Brandon Ayuk this year of phenomenal wide receiver. The problem was last year, it was just so hyper efficient in all these places. Like you just said, yards after catch, he was sixth. Right. I mean, just yards per reception, extremely high yards per route run, extremely high. If, you know, if those come back down to earth a little bit, then all of a sudden, you know, he just drops in that fancy rank. And I think that we could see the same thing. I have the same thing projected for Brandon Ayuk. So that, that is just my worry um, with Nico Collins. But enough about Nico Collins. Let's talk about a wide receiver that me and oh, Luke boy. Are like on. <laughs> We far apart on. I mean, Ty's kind of our middle man here. Um, but Lucas has got this guy all the way up at 25. I'm down at 43. This is like Christian Watson last year almost. <laughs> and then here at 35. Talk about Mr. George Pickens. So I or so Luke Luke Lucas, excuse me, would be boring to go to Ty's in the middle of here, and you can just tell us why he's average about it, George Pickens. Give us the case for George Pickens, Lucas. I mean, what what's going on with wide receiver 25? 
first and foremost, it's not my ranking that's blasphemous here. It's actually both of your rankings that are blasphemous because we're talking about a guy who is Brandon Ayuk light in 2023, right? We're talking about George Pickens who averaged 18.1 yards per reception. That was first in the league. A guy who was who saw uh, nearly 11 yards per target. That was 10.8. That was fifth in the league. Still saw 1,100 receiving yards last year. George Pickens is like the sneakiest 1,100-yard receiver in NFL history. That was 16th in the league last year. He did this all similar to Brandon Ayuk on only 106 targets and only seeing a target on 20.4% of his routes. That was 45th in the league last year. So we were talking about a guy who was hyper-efficient with his touches. And now, Ty, I know you're allergic to guys who are hyper-efficient because Brandon Ayuk is your wide receiver 20 this year. You hate Brandon Ayuk, and you, you very <laughs> <Rightfully> clearly <so. laughs> you very clearly don't like George Pickens either, because again, you're you're in the middle of Cameron and I here. But you can tell me that the Steelers stink. But what I'm going to do is put everybody through the spin cycle and basically refresh your perspective on why George Pickens is actually going to be a breakout candidate, is going to have a ton of upside in his profile this year. Because first and foremost. Deontay Johnson, he's no longer with this team. Four games without Deontay Johnson last year when he was injured. Remember, he sat out a few games last year. Pickens was averaging 22.7 fantasy points per game in those contests. All right. You now get Russell Wilson in as well, uh, who is a definite upgrade from Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, Mitch Trubisky. And now I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Russell Wilson is this elite game changer going to take George Pickens to an alpha level, but... Ty, I'm going to pick on you again. You you like Cortland Sutton this year. You frequently ponder about his success last year. How many touchdowns did Russell Wilson throw to Cortland Sutton last year? Uh, 10, if I remember he correctly. Throw, he did throw 10. He threw 10 touchdowns to Cortland Sutton last year. You want to know how many touchdowns Deontay Johnson and George Pickens combined for last year? 10. Each of them had five. This team only had 13 passing touchdowns. Last year, Cortland Sutton alone had 10 last year. So you're getting an upgrade here at quarterback. The Steelers, they also didn't bring in another big name wide receiver to compete with Pickens, right? We hear the oh, Brandon Ayuk rumors getting thrown around and, may, and maybe something happens there. You know, obviously, if something happens there, you know, we're, we're changing our rankings here. But as of right now, there's nobody there. Roman Wilson, he's a nice little piece, but let's just be honest. He doesn't profile as anything more than a wide receiver three for almost every other NFL team in the league. You got to remember, this is a guy entering his third year into the league as well, where the breakout rate is highest for wide receivers. So to have a clear cut wide receiver one on a team with Pickens profile that ranked outside of the top 35 wide receivers for the both of you. And that's just puzzling to me. So I think you both are wrong here. Tell me why I'm talking crazy, though. So for me, I don't see those touchdown numbers coming up because I understand that quarterbacks in Atlanta weren't great over the past three years. But under Arthur Smith, they threw for 54 touchdowns in three seasons. I mean, we're, we're not exactly talking about an elite passing attack over here. And Arthur Smith's a big factor for me in this. Like, I understand Russell Wilson, you know, was able to throw 26 passing touchdowns or whatever it was last year. But Arthur Smith is not a guy who's going to go out and call plays to hyper-target his best target because he didn't. He refused to do it, actually. He, he made statements to the media multiple times saying, this isn't your fancy football league. Pipe down. When he drafted Drake London, Kyle Pitts, and B. John Robinson in three years in a row and decided not to give them the ball. That's my worry with George Pickens. I think, yes, he, he has big plays. I looked at my rankings. I have his yards per reception too low. I have him closer to 13 and a half. I think he's closer to a 15 yards per reception guy. So maybe that bumps him up five or six spots in my rankings, but obviously that just puts me closer to Ty and not nearly in the realm of you, Lucas. I'm just worried that there isn't going to be enough consistency and the touchdowns. I understand he had Cortland Sutton last year. I just don't know if that's going to be the, that's necessarily going to translate over to George Pickens. Maybe you're, maybe play, you're trying way. so hard to not play the middleman right here because I know you like some George Pickens. I know you do Ty. But at the same time, you have to you have to try and make a case against me when you know I'm right. Can someone show the picture of the game against Tennessee when this guy is running <laughs> a fade into the end zone? He has like 
He has plenty of room to get like four steps in, and he, he has like 18 <laughs> yards. <laughs> he completely misses it. That's how I feel about George Pickens. It's like he's gonna have some like really cool plays because like we have a clip that we put in our TikToks very, very frequently of him doing the one-handed catch against Cleveland. Sick play that he has those kind of plays, and it's like that's the same. That's 14 on the Pittsburgh Steelers doing both plays, right? So that kind of speaks maybe in just a more kind of silly way of just saying like George Pickens, I think is going to find some inconsistencies this year. And I will also say this is, I'm the guy that stood on Drake London last year, called him a flag plant because I thought that last year was going to be the year I got burned by Arthur Smith and I, I'm okay with him at, you know, at certain costs this year, like best ball, it takes some convincing because he's what wide receiver 28. Mm -hmm. And I, I am not a huge fan of that. I can, I, I will have some exposure to it just because again, he is the guy, he is the number one in that Pittsburgh passing attack. Um, but I, I don't, I just, I struggle to figure, I, I don't know what his upside is. Is he a top 20 guy? Is he, he, I don't think he pushes top 15. I struggle to say that he's going to be that like low end wide receiver too. I think he could be a high end flex. That's his ceiling. I, and my, I've got him where wide receiver 35 in our rankings. Maybe that's a little too low, but I just find myself wanting just other players that I believe are just going to be in better offenses than George Pickens. So, so we're talking about Arthur Smith as this dude who kills wide receivers, right? And I think we can point to Drake. He does. London. We can point to Drake <laughs> London. We can point to Drake London and say, dude stinks. And Ty, that was you. I'm going to rewind a little bit. That was your mistake making Drake London a flag plant. I'm not going to make George Pickens oh. a flag plant this year. That was on you. Like that, 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 that's a misclick. That's user error right there. That's <laughs> that, that, uh, that's Arthur Smith. <laughs> he calls you a misclick. <laughs> But like I'm going, I'm going to point us back to when Arthur Smith was still in Tennessee too, because there is a sample here where George Pickens isn't the same athletic profile. He's not the same player as AJ Brown. He's not. I'm, I'm not. But but I'm saying we've seen success here. We've still seen an AJ Brown with nearly 1,100 receiving yards, over at least a thousand receiving yards in his first two years in the league. Eight touchdowns, 11 touchdowns, his two years with Arthur Smith. I I get the the recent track record is piss poor with wide receivers and Arthur Smith. But I think when we've seen some of these offensive coordinators go to head coaches, have to start juggling more responsibility, what they're good at actually suffers. And so I think if you get Arthur Smith back into more of a niche in Pittsburgh, sure. Is there going to be some stupid tomfoolery going on? Probably like that's just inevitable at this point, but looking around at this wide receiver, like there's not even a Kyle Pitts, like we can hype up Pat Fryermuth all we want, but you know, he's not a Kyle Pitts, right? So, for me, is George Pickens is my pick ranking for George Pickens towards the the upper end of where he could finish this year? Maybe I do think he has top twenty upside, though. I'm also not saying he doesn't have a floor of where you both have it ranked. I'm just saying I actually prefer his upside. I think with Russell Wilson at quarterback, someone more competent than literally anybody who was throwing Drake London the ball to, might I add, better than Marcus Mariota, better than Taylor Heineke, better than Desmond Ritter. Like, we can throw all those seven quarterbacks in a room and everybody's going to pick Russell Wilson as the best quarterback out of that bunch. So at some point, we have to look at that and say, you know what, it's an upgrade all around. Maybe, you know, as much as it could be Arthur Smith error, it could also just be like, dang, can we get a quarterback who knows how to throw the football into a tight window. Can we get a quarterback who can actually deliver the football accurately? Uh, and Russell Wilson is, is enough of an upgrade where I think we can see George Pickens be fantasy relevant, uh, certainly fantasy relevant, but you know, pour in some massive, massive weeks this next year with his explosiveness, but enough about wide receivers because Ty, you, you've got a running back ranked far too low. In my opinion, um, you have him close to where the experts have him over on fantasy pros. The expert consensus rankings have Jonathan Brooks as the wide receiver 36 Ty, You have him at the running back 34. 
Cameron and I both have him as a top 24 running back. Cam has him at 21. I have him at 24. So tell me why Jonathan Brooks shouldn't even be considered as a top 30 running back this year as Cameron. <laughs> Trying to intimidate me over here. Yeah. I do up a little bit here. <laughs> no, the look, the Jonathan Brooks hype just because of I, I'll call it his draft profile, right? When you look back at his film at Texas and his one year as a starter, it was pretty darn good. And you just wish that he stayed healthy, didn't tear an ACL, but it didn't really matter to Carolina because he still went in the second round. Right, He was the first running back taken in the draft. So Carolina didn't really care that it was, again, a torn ACL that he was going through. I think if you believe that Jonathan Brooks is the lead back right out of the gates at the beginning of the season, he's going to be in that top 24 range for you. For me, I just think it's going to be... Who's who's the other... Cam, who's the other running back here for... Chubba Hubba. Chubba Hubba. That's right. <laughs> Chubba Hubba. <laughs> no, I. it's because I think Chuba Hubbard plays a big role in this offense, at least right out of the gate, that does hinder his upside, at least maybe for the first half of the season. Right now, based on my projections, I've got Brooks statted out for 225 total touches between carries and receptions. I have Chuba Hubbard statted out for just shy of 200. I think this backfield by season's end is much more split. We'll take a look at the second half of the season be like, well, no, it was all Jonathan Brooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about season end totals. We can't forget that Chuba Hubbard. Yes, I know that the set, you know, from week 13 until the end of the season, they had an interim coach, very different offense, whatever the case is. The fact is they relied on Chuba Hubbard. They didn't want to rely on Brees Hall or not Brees Hall. Sorry, Bryce Young. Um, Look, Chuba Hubbard from weeks 13 to 18 was the running back 15 in fantasy points. He was the running back 12 in total expected fantasy points, the running back 16 in in expected fantasy points. They relied on this guy so much so that there were games where Chuba Hubbard had over 20 carries. And there was a time where we are looking at player props over on underdog fantasy, and they put his carry total at like 12 and a half, at like 13 and a half. And it's like easy higher easy one every single time because you knew that he was just going to get the rock then you we get to this spring and the carolina hires dave canales the guy that turned around this i shouldn't say turn around but he he got this tampa bay offense to a pretty pretty solid unit they scored a lot mike evans was a top 10 wide receiver baker mayfield looked like a franchise quarterback for the first time in his career. I, I shouldn't say in his career because they did make the playoffs with him in in, uh, in Cleveland. Regardless, Dave Canales was asked uh, which players in the spring stood out to him. Who stood out during the spring? And I'm just going to read the quote. On offense, I can't talk about effort without talking about Chuba Hubbard and Tommy Tremble. I was going to bring up this quote. <laughs> Yep. Two guys that really push each other to get their work in, to work on the small things, taking care of their bodies, the effort we're looking for in practice. These guys are at the front of what we're talking about, trying to push the tempo, trying to make sure that the defense can feel the attacking style that we have. These are guys that have really stood out for me this spring as leaders in that regard. He's making an impression on the head coach. And I, I, I still think Chuba Hubbard plays a great role in this offense, at least for the first half of the season. That impacts where Jonathan Brooks finishes by season's end. I was going to bring up that quote because I was going to say, man, that's cool. He's talking about uh, Tommy Tre- or not Tommy Tremble. Uh, yeah, Tommy Tremble and Chuba Hubbard in that regard. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're they're intensity pushers. They're, they work hard. Yeah. Okay, but now here here's what here's what. Here's what uh, Dave Canales had to say about Jonathan Brooks. Versatility, first and foremost. Our system calls for a back that can be used, of course, just in a traditional way. Handed to him. Then can we get this player in space, being able to get in perimeter screens, checkdowns. We've got a really cool empty package. Use the backs, fucks the bucket, matchups, things like that. He's bigger. He's got range. There's so much he brings out from a versatility standpoint. That's probably the biggest thing that stood out. And Just vision, patience, contact balance, acceleration. Like, he's got it all. He's the best back in this class. 
and we're so fired up just to be able to bring him in and create competition that Dan talked about. So I understand it's a competition piece, but I don't know what I'd rather be talked about is the guy who possesses a ton of versatility, who is talked about being used in these super unique packages or just, yeah, he's got good effort. Yeah. He pushes the pace. Now this, that being said, can Jonathan Brooks start the year on the pop? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. I think that's a possibility that isn't being talked about enough. And I think Chuba could play a bigger role at the start of the season. I'm not going to disagree with that. But the way this coaching staff looks at him, the way this coaching staff talks about him, the prospect profile that we all liked here, to me, says it is worth the cost. It is worth the risk. And this is a team that wants to get the ball into his hands. It's going to be Rashad White-esque in a way where, you know, Chuba Hubbard will play a role, but you know, Jonathan Brooks appears to be the guy who may get the majority of the work, who may get a majority of the receiving work. And this is a team that's going to need to get the ball in the playmaker's hands because they really don't have any outside of him and Deontay Johnson. Yeah, I mean, he's a four, but he's a tryhard. That's what I got out of Chuba Hubbard there. I mean, <laughs> the dude is just, uh, what? He averaged 3.8 yards per carry last year. He averaged 4.1 yards per touch, 49th in the NFL. He had a true yards per carry according to player profile, 3.7, which is 48th. Yards created, he had he was 22nd despite having 230 carries. Like, I understand, like, you know, he's he's you know, his name is fun, but watching him play is not fun, right? He is he is just not that guy. I I I honestly have zero faith in him. Uh, it really hurt my heart last year that Miles Sanders was bad enough that he couldn't outplay him. Um, so you know, the one year I decided to be in on Miles Sanders. But I, I just think talent-wise, what Dave Canales wants to do in the passing game with Jonathan Brooks, you know, I think that's a big part of it. I also think one big thing, just looking at our rankings, is Ty, you got Jonathan Brooks down for four touchdowns, four total touchdowns. That's it. And whereas I'm at, you know, seven rushing touchdowns and two receiving. So obviously, you know, if he does only finish with four touchdowns which is not out of the realm of possibilities, by the way, right? That that definitely could happen on this Carolina offense, even if he's a full-time back, right? That that would for sure lower him down the ranking. So um, I, I do want to just acknowledge that that is within the range of outcomes, that he could hit 1,000 yards, he could have you know 40 receptions and score three touchdowns because this team is just not in the red zone at all because they just don't have another difference maker. Um, I... I think the biggest discrepancy, though, is is just that I I don't see Chuba Hubbard, Chuba Hubbard, Chuba Hubbard, Chuba Chuba whatever his name is as a threat, <laughs> whereas it sounds like you do. So, um, I, I just think that's the biggest discrepancy between our rankings is me and Lucas see Jonathan Brooks coming in being the guy day one, where you're like maybe week eight, yeah, he fully takes over, but I think it's going to take a little more time. Yeah, and I mean that's. I, I'm glad to know that you listened right from the get go because that's what I let <laughs> off with. But yeah, um, <laughs> no, I I was just summing it up. My goodness, you were, you were, you were, you were. That's I again. I I I, I think I celebrated you not being on the pod. <laughs> I, I I'm now realizing this. Um, again, I I think coaches look for effort at least in the beginning of the season. And then by some point in the season, usually by the bye week, these coaches then go, you know what? Let's just get talent on the field, right? Talent will figure out talent will win at the end of the day. And I think that's what's going to happen with Carolina, right? You are in a rebuilding season. You are not competing right now. Just get anyone in it everyone that wants to be on the field that is show that shows that they're capable of being on the field. And then you can really see like, okay, who's going to be our guy for the future. And I think that will be Jonathan Brooks. I just think it's right out of the gate that this, that Chuba Hubbard is still going to play a major role in the offense. Well, then on that note, we'll take a quick break. We'll be back with three more player debates. We'll be back shortly. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. 
Two picks will triple your money. Three will six times it. Four will ten times it. And five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too. So if only four of your five props hit, you still get 10 times your entry. And if you use our code fellas when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. Alrighty, we are back. We have debated Nico Collins, George Pickens, and Jonathan Brooks thus far. Unfortunately, we are going to talk about another Carolina Panther because this is a guy who, Cameron, I like, I think, like, you know how I talked about Kyle Pitts earlier this week as like, you know, he's he's your toxic ex, the you up. I feel like yeah. this is, De- Deontay Johnson is exactly that for you where, you have him up at the wide receiver, the wide receiver twenty three, ooh, and can or Ty and I, oh, dare I have <laughs> Deontay Johnson at wide receiver thirty two for me and wide receiver wide receiver forty five for Ty. So oh. again, I'm more of the middleman here, but my gosh, top twenty four wide receiver, a wide receiver two this year. Are you just assuming this man is barely alive by the end of the year because he's drowning in targets? Yes. Yes, I agree. I agree with our good friend of the pod, Andrew Erickson. Uh, That was a great tweet by him. This man is going to be drowning in targets because let's be honest, Adam Thielen is not who he once was. Um, He is just a slight, you know, four and a half steps slower than he used to be um i would say maybe three years ago he was a step and a half (laughs) maybe maybe three years ago he was a step slower but um and then you got xavier leggett who could be great but he's not exactly a you know i need a first down let's throw it to the guy who's going to be open kind of player um and then jonathan mingo um he was a fun one to like for like 35 days. And then, you know, he's kind of, he's their wide receiver yep. four. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. But, that, but that's what it comes down to for me, for Deontay Johnson is targets. Like I, I have him stat out for 150 targets because I just think he's going to get peppered with the ball. I, I could see him having another season where he hits 150 targets and it's below 10 yards per reception where he's below five touchdowns, but it's just the volume is enough that it's going to keep coming. I mean, Last year, obviously, was awful, right? He was injured, and then when he was on the field, he still wasn't great. But before that, target-wise, he had 147, 169, 144 targets, and even 92 his rookie season. So, right, this guy gets volume. The issue was in 2022, he didn't score a single touchdown, which which was the anomaly, right? Because even last year when he was poor, he still had at least five. So I'm not worried about zero touchdowns again. And in this offense, I, I think he's the unquestioned wide receiver one. So that's where the ranking comes from is it's one of those. We say it every year about certain guys. He is this guy. Don't watch the game. Do not watch the game because it will be disgusting, but it, just look at the box score at the end of the day and it'll give you your 14, you know, fantasy points, 15 fantasy points. Um, and that that's kind of how I view Deontay Johnson this season. The only thing I'm concerned about with Deontay Johnson is the discrepancy in all of our targets across the board. I'm just looking at how we have them all statted out. It's shocking to me. I'm really, really curious to hear your thoughts, Ty, because like Cameron, you've got Deontay Johnson up at a hundred and what was it? 152 targets. Yep. Uh, where'd he go? Yes. 152 targets. I've got Deontay Johnson down uh, for why can't I find him there? He has 139 targets, but Ty, you've got him all the way down at 119 targets. So I think oh. you're right. I, th- I think I think targets is the thing that's going to be the difference maker here in all of our rankings. Uh, my my other concern is I don't know if Deontay Johnson is this alpha, super athletic kind of guy. Like when we look at profiles. I would much rather bet on a guy like George Pickens than I would a guy like Deontay Johnson. Uh, just to bring up another guy in my rankings. Now, Deontay Johnson could absolutely see more targets. I 100% agree. I think George Pickens is probably going to score more touchdowns and have far more explosive plays throughout the year. So again, that's me where I'm like, you can give me Deontay Johnson's 142 targets at like nine and a half yards of reception. I'll take George Pickens' 120 targets at you know 15 and a half per reception i'd rather bet on that 
that's my only gripe with Deontay. I mean, you're you're right. He's the unparalleled wide receiver one in this offense. He's better than Adam Thielen. I said it with Jonathan Brooks. He's really the only other playmaker they have um, outside of Deontay and Jonathan Brooks. It's those two. But Ty, like, uh, how is this target distribution breaking out for you? Where you only have Deontay Johnson at 120 targets, is it just less pass attempts and truly like leaning into what Dave Canales is saying with more rush attempts? But given your ranking of Jonathan Brooks, I don't know if that's the case. So, so walk me through your process there. I let's see. I'm just looking through it. It is a little bit of Adam Thielen still. I got a feeling. I got a feeling that he just won't quit just yet. I do think Xavier Leggett does come on towards the end of uh, towards the second half of the season. So I don't think that like we're going to like Cam, how many targets do you have him projected for again? 152. 152 divided by 17. It's roughly nine targets a game. I don't know. Yes, he can give you some weeks that he's going to give you like 11 or 12 targets a game. I I don't think it's going to be that much. I think the ball is going to be spread around more in this offense. Now, I will admittedly say, I think wide receiver 45 is a little too low. Just kind of doing my own research and stuff. They really do rate Deontay Johnson very highly. They think that he can win as an X. They think that he can be the guy in this offense. If that's the case, then it becomes a question of touchdowns. And I think that is probably then going to be, you know, something that is going to be tough for me to buy into because mm -hmm. that's just not his profile. You've got a Xavier Leggett. You then have Jonathan Brooks. You then have Chuba Hubbard. You then have Tommy Tremble, who are just absolute hustle guys. You never know. Um, <laughs> lead I, into I, the I, narrative. I know. Lead it we into got the him. We <laughs> got him. We got him. Um, no, I, I, I think that's then the, the question you have to ask. He can get the volume. You may believe in it. I know you do, Cam. I, I, I see and I hear the argument. The question is then just scoring. And I just don't <laughs> think this Carolina offense scores that much. And when they get closer to the red zone, I don't know if Deontay is going to be that guy. Yep. No. And, and I agree. Like that's part of the rankings too. And that's why we're coming up with the upside meter with the consistency meter this next week in our draft guide is because Deontay Johnson for me, this is the upside, right? I, I have, cause certain, you know, we're not going to rank every guy in the medium, right? Cause some of it takes projection for me. Seven touchdowns is probably the ceiling. Maybe eight for Deontay Johnson is like a fantastic year. You're super excited. You know, 150 targets. That's the ceiling for Deontay Johnson. He's not going to get you 13 yards per reception. So you're not going to see something like 1,300 yards. So this wide receiver 20 ranking is pretty close to the ceiling for Deontay. So I, I acknowledge that as well. And then the other thing for me, a big reason why is if when I looked at this team, the closest wide receiver to me on this team to Chris Godwin was Deontay Johnson. I look at Chris Godwin's stats last three years, 136, 142, 130, 130 targets, right? And there's no Mike Evans. I, I know there's a whole bunch of other wide receivers, but there's no Mike Evans. So that's where that extra confidence for the volume comes in for me. And I'm not saying Deontay Johnson is Chris Godwin. I, I think Chris Godwin is one of the most undervalued, underrated wide receivers we have in the NFL. And I think, I think Chris Godwin's ahead of him, but I think not having that Mike Evans just gives me that confidence that, hey, Deontay can attain this volume on this team. Yeah, I was hoping you would bring up the Chris Godwin argument because he is just an absolute target machine, um, you know, despite only seeing, what, 136 last year. I mean, yeah, was was still the guy who, you know, from the slot commands targets. Um, yeah. I think you're right. I think that is the case for Deontay Johnson this year. And again, you brought up at the start, as uh, Andrew Erickson, friend of the show, tweeted out, I am concerned about Deontay Johnson because he may be drowning in targets uh, this year. We'll keep it moving with our rankings here. I guess I'm on the block again. I guess I got to explain to you two why you're both low on rankings again. I don't know. I don't want to introduce my own case, though. That seems kind of... Uh, oh, I can do it for you. I dropped the ball. We talked about this earlier. My host... I'm not I'm not back in the hosting. You know, like, I'm just not <laughs> used to it. When I see Lucas's face, I just... You know, talk, tune out, Switch talk, off. tune out, you know. So <laughs> I'm back on the ball. Lucas is obscenely high on Zamir White. He went, obscenely. hey, this guy had 
had four good games last year. Let's put him as my wide receiver sit or running back six. So, Lucas, why don't you explain your ranking? I'm just kidding. He's running back 19. <laughs> I'm, just um, say, I'm like, where are you pulling that from? <laughs> he is my running back 33 and Tyler's running back 31. So, Lucas, why the heck are you in love with Zamir White? I've seen people say Zamir White could be this year's 2020 Mike Davis, right? Remember the year where we're all like, oh, Mike Davis. Quadzilla. Finally gets the opportunity. Yeah, quadzilla. Do you see those quads, man? Top 20 lock. Uh, yes. but like the guy you overinflate uh because of his perceived volume, the role he's inheriting, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right. The thing we can differentiate from Mike Davis and Zamir White, though, is that Mike Davis was a journeyman in the league before finally getting his chance to fill in for Chris McCaffrey in 2019. Uh, Zamir has just been waiting in the wings behind Josh Jacobs. This isn't a guy who's been around the block a handful of times who is you know, six, seven years, six years into his career before finally getting a shot. Like, Samir White is entering his third year into the league. Now, I completely understand the the Raiders' offense isn't going to be great this year. I don't think they need to be, though, in order for, for Zamir White to be a, you know, top 20, even borderline top 20 running back, right? If we even, you know, put him in more of the, the 21, 22, 23 conversation. In his four games to close out the year, right, you, again, you mentioned it, Cameron, he had four really good games. He averaged 23.3 touches in those games. He averaged 4.67 yards per carry and finished between the RB12 and the RB20 every week. So you were automatically getting a a top 20 running back in those games. Granted, two of those were blowouts, uh, but the Raiders went 3-1 during that stretch as well. The rest of the offense to this offseason, it definitely didn't get worse. I mean, you got Gardner Minshew, who will likely be the starter, but you know, at at worst, it's Aiden O'Connell again. Uh, who, again, we still saw in those four games, Zamir White could be a fantasy-relevant back. You add Barack Bowers in the draft as well. He adds uh, another level to make this offense better. And you look at Zamir White's competition, it's it's Alexander Madison, who we all despise, who we all couldn't wait to get off the field in Minnesota, who still when, my Ty, Chan- when, when <laughs> Ty Chandler was given the opportunity in Minnesota, they when Madison returned then they couldn't take Ty Chandler off the field because of how good he was. And then like Dylan Lobby again, like shouts to Dylan Lobby, six round guy getting hype in June. We love to see it, but sorry, I'm not scared off by a sixth round pick. So I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that Zamir white is going to see 20 plus touches every game this year. But I will say every running back that had at least 16 and a half touches per game last year and played at least 12 games finished as a top 24 running back last year. So Zamir White even gets 16, 17 touches per game. I think there's a really good chance that he finishes inside uh, you know, the RB2 range this year. That's why I have him at running back 19, because I do think he's, you know, a, a, he'll probably be a 17, 18 touch per game kind of guy. My issue with Zamir White is I don't see him being in a like a above average receiving back so I think that caps some of the ceiling and we look at last I mean even in those four games that you mentioned 4.1 yards per carry then he did go 6.6 yards per carry but then 3.6 on 20 carries and 4.5 so he's not an elite running back I worry that he's similar to what Madison was last year where you're like, Oh, he, you know, he shows flashes, but over a full season, can he maintain it? We talk about health with this guy. I, he's, if I'm not mistaken, he's had both ACLs replaced or maybe it was the same one twice um, in college. Right. So he's, he's dealt with those injuries. I just don't think I'm convinced that he's going to be the guy that even if he gets volume is going to be good with it. Like similar to almost Chuba Hubbard last year. Um, where, you know, he had 230 carries, but he had 3.8 yards per carry. He just wasn't on a team that was great. I I don't think he's the greatest running back. Um, so that's my worry. I don't like, like you said, I don't see Alexander Madison coming in and all of a sudden being the starting running back. Like that's not a worry with Zamir white. So I do understand being a little bit higher on him because of that. Cause you know, as long as he's healthy, he's a starter. I just worry about the efficiency and just any receiving upside that would come, you know, with him starting. I do want to correct myself quickly before you jump into. I do believe Zamir White is entering. No, he is entering his third year into the league. I lied. You can continue. I I can't. You know the the efficiency argument is a pretty big component for me. The reception upside pretty limited to like as much as we 
don't rate Alexander Madison. He is going like he is the receiving back compared to him and Zamir White. So I and I keep I know this is you, you brought up the, you guys were talking about Cooper Cup last episode and you're like you shouldn't really you shouldn't hold on to you know the the seasons that happened three years ago and stuff like that. But I can't. I there's something to Luke Getze being in Green Bay while Devontae Adams had his two most productive seasons. There is something to that for me that just says they are going. To, I, I'm not going to say that they're going to be Green Bay light, but I see them getting a little too creative in the red zone, maybe that is going to hurt Zamir White. Yes, he can still score on the goal line and stuff like that. I, I just think you've got Brock Bowers. You've got Devontae Adams. I don't think that, yes, he could be, you know, he could be lead back. He may get you 13, 14, 50 carries a game. Again, back to the efficiency. I don't know how efficient those are going to be for him. I feel like he's going to be like Sony Michelle from 2021. Where don't rip he, on Sony. Don't rip I on Sony. To. Leave I his name to. out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Sony Michelle was the running back 32. Despite being the lead back in that Rams offense, he didn't get over 900 yards. I feel like that's a very, that is in his range of outcomes. He could be in this running back 19 talk if everything goes his way. If things don't go his way, he's kind of stuck in that low. He's like that running back three as a depth piece kind of guy. So I'm not going to sit here and try and argue that Zamir White has like top 12 upside this year. I don't, I don't believe that. Again, if we're this this like, one, actually, <laughs> this is this feels like almost like the Deontay Johnson argument, though, right? Where it's like nobody is going to say he has more upside than what he actually possesses. And could the floor be lower? Absolutely. But I mean, we even look at guys. You know, finishing right in the 17 to I'll say 25 range last year in terms of their targets. I mean, you had David Montgomery at the running back 17 who had 24, James Conner at the running back 18 who had 33, Ken Walker at 19 who had 37, Swift only had 49 targets, Brian Robinson Jr. only had 43, Najee Harris with 38, Devon Achan only had 37, uh, Gus Edwards only had 13 targets last year. So, I mean, I don't think Zamir White needs to see, you know, 60 targets in order to, to be the running back 19. I think he just needs to have a balance of like, can he hit, you know, 40 to 45 targets and score, you know, eight times this year. And I think he, I think he hits this number. Um, I don't think he needs to be the bell cow perfectly well-rounded back. I'm just going to bet on a guy who I think is going to be the lead in this offense. And I do think ultimately ends up being, I mean, and even in the games, right. Where, you know, he, he didn't see that many targets. I mean, he did have two games with two of those games where he had four targets and six targets, but one in two and the other two, but he was given 22 rush attempts and 25 rush attempts in the other two. Again, I understand that's more the nature of those games, but this is a guy who I think, I don't think they're going to be shy about giving him, you know, 16, 17 touches per game this year. And that, is enough for me to, to potentially put him into, um, you know, the, this running back to conversation. One last thing. Were those games that they were winning? Uh, yes. I do, I, two, I, two of them were blowouts. Cause I, yeah, I, I like the one game that I remember is what was it? Week 17. No, not week 17. Whatever game it was against the chargers. <laughs> yes. Where Brandon Saley <laughs> got fired the day after. Yep. Yep. That was one of them. Correct. I, I think that also plays a fact or that that plays a role into this as well into the equation is where do we see Vegas's offensive output as a team? If we think that they can be middle of the pack, I think Zamir White can be in this like low end wide receiver or not wide receiver running back to range. If we expect them to be more bottom half than anything, then I think again, more depth piece. Counterpoint to your counterpoint, Zamir White only had 17 rush attempts in that game. No. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh you're point. you're you're acting like you're he counter. he like you you saw this counter to counter to your counter. I'm just saying, <laughs> like if, if we're gonna use that and it's like, yeah, it's a blowout, but like theoretically, then Zamir White should have seen 25 rush attempts in that game instead of week 18 against Denver. I understand what you're saying. I, but I yeah. It. 
I right, but but so so I the difference here is is I believe Zamir White you know, can be a, you know, 17, 18 touch per game kind of guy. And you both are like, mm-hmm. eh, he'll sit at 14, 15, probably, yep. which is fine. We'll agree to disagree there. Last player though, Ty, I don't like this player this year. I actually think he's probably being overdrafted right now. Um, it's a game that I don't want to play because I've seen thousands upon thousands of other people play this game and lose it before. You are just like, you, you're like I almost like you're, not, you, you're doing more than social distancing from this player um, because Xavier Worthy is currently your wide receiver 62. Oh my tie! Despite being Cameron's wide receiver 45, my wide receiver 47. So like Cameron and I are like anti Xavier Worthy at his current ADP, but you you are like the furthest thing from anti you are like the dude doesn't even exist in my world so how in the world can we be this far apart on xavier worthy's adp despite all three of us not being the biggest fans of him yeah i had to go back and like double triple check my rankings just to make sure that i didn't like miscalculate anything or didn't like incorrectly pull or like anything like that with a different formula or something like that or nope wide receiver 62 and I think what this comes down to is just the fact that we are talking about another wide receiver that is less than 175 pounds. And these times, these kinds of wide receivers typically do not succeed in their rookie season. And I think, I think a lot of people are just infatuated by the fact that like, yes, he has Patrick Mahomes and he's in Kansas city. And we just saw Tank Dell do it last year. Right. I do. I I want you guys to just understand how much of an anomaly last year was for Tank Dell in the grand scheme of all these wide receivers that are similar in their size. Right? There have been only let me see thirteen wide receivers that have had more than sixty targets in their rookie season that are one hundred and seventy five pounds or less. There are some notable names, right? You've got Jordan Addison from last year, Josh Downs. You had Devontae Smith. You had Deshaun Jackson. You had Darnell Mooney. Let me see here. I got to, I can't even read. There we go. Titus Young. There we go. Ace Sanders. Then Tank Dell. Then we're looking at Hollywood Brown. Hey, that's another name we know, but guess what? He's his teammate. Interesting. Anyway, Tavon Austin. (laughs) Then there is this guy, Dennis Northcutt. Then Taylor Gabriel. Yeah, who? And then Marvin Minnis? Not Marvin Mims. Marvin Minnis. Okay. Oh, you're just making up names at this point. I wish I was. That's historical data for you, folks. Anyway, you take a look at all of their stats, right? Again, each one of those guys got more than 60 targets. The average stat line for all of those wide receivers, 50 receptions, 86 targets, 655 yards, and... Uh, let's see here, roughly 10 fantasy points per game. And you look at each one of them, Jordan Addison had 13, 9.2, 10.9, 10.8, 9.5, 9.2, 7.4. Then here comes Tank Dell, 16.5, 10.5, 9.8, 5.6, 6.6, 6.9. Tell me which one is the anomaly here. It's Tank Dell. And I think a lot of people also don't really know the pace that this guy was on for his season. He would have finished, if he stayed healthy, the pace that he was on, he would have had 80 receptions, 128 targets for over 1,200 yards and 12 touchdowns. He would have been the wide receiver 10. We cannot take what happened with Tank Dell last year in Houston and just say, hey, it works for every single one of these wide receivers that are in similar size. It doesn't work like that. Now, I think a lot of people will say, well, if Rasheed Rice is going to be suspended for half the season, then we're going to see a lot more Xavier Worthy at the beginning of the season. Absolutely. I don't think there's anything that says that that won't happen just because outside of Hollywood Brown and Xavier Worthy, it's Justin Watson. It's Sky Moore. Am I forgetting anybody? I don't think so. Like, we're going to see Worthy on... Huh? Irv Smith. That's right. (laughs) Irv Smith. (laughs) <laughs> My favorite waiver wire pickup right after the draft. <laughs> um, again, I, I, 
if if you think Rasheed Rice gets this, gets a lengthy suspension, then I think where you guys have him ranked in that what in the forties, forty five and forty seven. Yeah, we're both kind of kind of wide receivers below ADP though. Like we're talking about right. Xavier Worthy going as like the wide receiver thirty eight right now. Yeah, and where I have, I have. Let's see here. I've got Xavier Worthy at roughly eight and a half fantasy points per game. Maybe it was a little too low because I think you can also make the argument too, like, well, Xavier Worthy can be the chess piece. He's got the Tyreek Hill kind of speed again. Like they've got that element in their offense again. I am not ready to just say that's a one for one. You can't just replace. I mean, speed is not the same. Tyreek Hill is one of one. Xavier Worthy is not Tyreek Hill. So I think, I think a lot of people are saying like it's worked Last year with Tank Dell, he's in Kansas City. Rasheed Rice can have a suspension. A lot of things can go right. And I'll end with this. Can Xavier Worthy hit this year? Absolutely. He can absolutely demolish his ADP and be kind of the rookie stud of the season. I will not deny that. I also just want, maybe it's me just trying to swing the pendulum back towards the middle and just saying, this dude's floor is ridiculously low. And if you're not, if you don't, if you if you don't see that, and you think that it's great value or anything like that, I, I just have a tough time buying that narrative. So I feel like the, the the case that you made is for all the people out there who are saying Xavier Worthy is worth it at his ADP. He's going to outperform his ADP. To which I would agree with your perspective in saying he's not going to because we share that opinion, right? We're all below ADP here. Where I get stuck on how you keep him at the wide receiver 62 and not even like a top 50 option is how many of the guys that you listed were first round draft picks. We had first round capital invested into them because half of those guys we named, I guarantee they weren't first round draft picks and we don't have to tally that up right now. I think we know like the handful Devonta Smith, Jordan Addison, right? Like the, the majority of those guys we can know because they were drafted in the first round. These other guys who were like, you know, literally who, like, who are you? Like, those are all guys who, you know, were not taken with that kind of capital. I'm going to presume, and maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me if I, if I am. There's something about this too, though, that like, I, I do need to boil in the fact that when Rasheed Rice is going to miss time, there are targets that are going to need to be redistributed there. Like just looking at our targets, how you only have Xavier Worthy down for 88 targets this year. And Cameron and I are up at 110 for him. And I think that's, again, that's our biggest discrepancy, but like, you know, 88 targets over a, you know, 17 game season is only, you know, five targets a game for the guy. And so if, if Rasheed Rice is going to miss time, I think we're going to see, you know, closer to seven targets, six, seven targets per game when you spend first round capital on him for you know, the, the first chunk of the season. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's after when Rasheed Rice comes back that we have questions on all of a sudden, which is why he's lower in my rankings, which is why I don't have him at that 38, you know, wide receiver 38 ADP. I'm just, I'm just shocked. You have him all the way down at 62 uh, when, when he's a first round pick. Now, I guess, I guess I can't be talking because I have Keon Coleman who was early second round, um, you know, <laughs> way down in my rankings. But again, he's one that I've openly admitted is going to be a riser for me. But Cameron, what about you? What, like how how do we find this balance of like we're all out on the guy, but where is the pro argument in here? Because I because I, again I don't disagree with anything yeah. I said. I just I like I'm trying to be careful to not always be going against the like opposite end of the pendulum of mm-hmm. like Xavier Worthy is him he's Tyree Kill and trying to talk more of the middle ground perspective here of like this is the reality and the reality is that he's probably not the guy he's too niche of a player. And let's just call it that reality and not expect the worst or the best for him. The issue is, is where Ty has him is close to the floor, right? Cause, cause right. we talk about it. We've never seen a third option, you know, succeed in this offense. It's been, you know, Tyree killing Travis Kelsey or Rasheed Rice and Travis Kelsey. The way he outperforms ADP is if he's better than Hollywood, right? From, from the get go, he, he's, he has the second option. You know, he's that outside guy. So even when Rasheed Rice comes back, he's still consistently on the field. He's still consistently getting targets. That That's what has to happen in order for him to return on ADP. The issue becomes he's not ready this year. Maybe maybe he's not, you know, maybe he's not ready ever. Maybe he's just this year. 
Marquise Brown's ahead of him. He's the third option no matter what. So he's a glorified MVS on this team. Rasheed Rice comes back. He's the fourth guy. He's barely on the field. But the, we do know this team's going to throw a lot. It's just how good is Xavier Worthy? That That's what this whole take has to be is this season, do you believe that he's better than Hollywood? And do you believe that he's on that same level as a Rasheed Rice when he does come back? Because if he is, then yes, he can return on ADP. If he's not, if he's not better than Hollywood, then I see a world where he does fall down, you, you know, could tumble down towards Ty. I think me and you are both in the, where maybe towards the end of the season, he starts coming along a little bit more, right? Them, them understanding, hey, Hollywood's on a one-year deal. It's not like we need to pepper him with targets because if he walks next year, he walks unless Hollywood has a, you know, crazy breakout season. So that's, that's I think, the entire spectrum of Xavier Worthy. That's why he's maybe, you know, we talked about him a couple of weeks ago as one of the hard, hardest guys to kind of figure out where to take him. Because, yes, the ceiling's crazy, but the floor is crazy, too, and it's all dependent on, you know, right now, you have to take the call of, yes, I think Xavier Worthy is great. Us, we're like, he needs at least a year to really, you know, before we're like, okay, I'm in, I'm truly in on Xavier Worthy. And the last point that I'll make, too, here. When Rishi Rice comes back, is I think we all agree that he's going to be suspended at, for a, some length of the season. You were then looking at a trio of Xavier Worthy, Hollywood Brown, and Rasheed Rice. The Kansas City Chiefs, the last two seasons, have ranked in the bottom 12 in three wide receiver set usage. And with what we saw in the second half of the season, where Rasheed Rice ultimately just kind of broke through as the top wide receiving option, granted, in a in a wide receiver room that was pretty, pretty weak. They started moving Rasheed Rice into the slot. And I don't think Xavier Worthy wins enough on the outside or can make a difference enough on the outside to really be a major contributor once all three of these are healthy or once once all three are playing. Now, again, this trio, Kansas City has not had the past two years. So is there the chance that they go three more three wide receiver sets? I think so. But again, Rishi Rice dominated from the slot. And I think that's where Xavier Worthy is going to succeed the most in Rishi Rice's absence. So once Rice comes back, what happens? And that's that also plays into wide receiver 62. We'll put a bow on everything there. Six player debates, Ooh. six ranking debates. Debating if we do another one of these episodes as the season progresses I... as, our, as our rankings continue to change. I feel like we might need to slide one more in somewhere. I got to say, these last two episodes we've done have been two of my favorite, just because it is, you got to take a stance on a guy. You got to say, okay, I'm in, I'm out, you know, the forget, forget last week, you know, now yep. defend your rankings. I've I've just loved, even if you guys have hated listening to them, I've loved <laughs> doing them these last, these last two episodes. Which is most important. We love yes. our Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hey, look, if you want to check out our rankings, uh, those are in our draft guide for the 2024 season. That is down in the description of the audio podcast or YouTube video you are listening to. $10 there, fellasdraftguide.com. Or if you want to go put that $10 into Underdog instead, join their contest to win a share of $15 million they have out for grabs uh, in their NFL contest this summer. Use the code fellas when you sign up on Underdog. You'll get a free square for their pick'em lobby. Uh, you'll get your first deposit matched 50% up to $250. And we'll send you that draft guide for 100% free as well. So again, fellowsdraftguide.com or code fellows over on Underdog Fantasy and join one of their contests. We'll be back next week. We got another mock draft on the slate for next week. Uh, and then we only got one episode because it is the 4th of July. It is Independence Day next week. So only one podcast, only oh, one YouTube video. That was, not, that was not the time for your music videos, Cameron. We will pull up your old your old middle school YouTube videos, music videos if we have to. Uh, we'll be back next week. It's only a mock draft. Only one YouTube video as well. Uh, hey, look, enjoy your weekend. Until next week, and before we go off the rails, stay safe, stay healthy. We'll talk to you all next week. Deuces. Deuces. Deuces.